single day, like I've always done and always will. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Chantal Dastra. After weeks of negotiations between the governor and legislative leaders, the final fiscal year 25 state budget has officially been passed. The budget agreement comes three weeks after the original April 1st deadline, and the sticking points of negotiations this year were largely centered around housing, education, health care, and crime. The total budget came in at $237 billion. Let's go through some of the big highlights. Leaders came together on a housing proposal that focused on building affordable housing in New York City and included a scaled-down version of the good cause eviction legislation. On education, the Rockefeller Institute of Government and the State Education Department will examine the foundation aid formula and provide recommendations. There were also investments made to maternal and mental health initiatives, as well as savings for Medicaid. And on crime, the budget tackled retail theft and enforcement on illegal cannabis shops. To help unpack the final state budget and the overall budget process, we're joined in studio by Zach Williams of Bloomberg Law, Vaughn Golden of the New York Post, and Alex Galt of the Watertown Daily Times and Northern New York newspapers. So naturally, I wanted to start on housing. I think it's fair to say this year, the governor and legislative leaders knew they had to do something on housing coming out of last year. Um, the governor made it clear that she wanted to focus on supply, while legislative leaders said, you know, there would be absolutely no housing deal without tenant protection. So as a result, in the final budget, you know, they put together a housing proposal that really focused on affordable housing in New York City, but also included um, a scaled back version of good cause eviction. So how did we get to this point? I think there was uh, a lot of back and forth uh, within the negotiations there. Um, early on, the governor put forward uh, her version of good cause, uh, which, as, as you mentioned, was uh, I guess we can call it a, a little bit of a watered down version of Senator Salazar's bill, right. uh, which was kind of the, um, the hallmark model for good cause. Uh, and from there, uh, you also had, as far as a 421A, the uh, tax incentive to build affordable units, uh, the renewal of that program or extension of that program and the new iteration of that was combined with a wage deal with the building trades. Uh, so that eventually fell into place after some back and forth. There was some uh, widely publicized disagreement within the building trades in their negotiations with the Real Estate Board of New York. Um, but given, given a few weeks after the deadline, uh, things started to fall into place. There was certainly a, a lot of fury from all of the, the different sides uh, sure. chiming in on that. Um, but I, I think as, as Zach and a number of other folks opined, um, the, um, the amount of unhappiness that people were expressing was almost a, a sign that things were coming together. Uh, and ultimately, uh, by the end, they were able to settle on something. You really can't discount the intersection of political incentives here. You know, Governor Kathy Hochul had what you might call a series of political disasters in 2023, which mm -hmm. included pushing a, a housing proposal that, while um, praised perhaps as, as a good policy idea, just was not politically realistic. But flash forward to this year, she still wants a political victory on housing to turn things around. But we also have legislators running for re-election. And you see a lot of moderate Democrats who aren't necessarily the most um, tenant-friendly historically, yeah. Yeah. all of a sudden getting behind this idea of, of increasing tenant protections just as these left-wing primary challenges are looming. And I think that had a lot to do with getting both sides to the table this time. So would you all categorize this as an overall win for Democrats heading into election season? I mean, they knew they had to do something, right? So they did. Is it an overall win? It, politically, it's always good to get something done, because then you can talk about it. Yeah. Now, whether this is good policy, it's going to take months, if not you know, a year or two, to really figure out. And the jury is really out on that. But the fact that it wasn't a repeat of 2023 when nothing got done at all. Yeah. I mean, people need housing, especially in New York City and even upstate. You know, there's a real shortage of units. Prices are going up. And, you know, the fact that they can say they did something about that, 
really gives them to talk, something to talk about, not only in their primaries, but in the general election when the Republicans are going to come forward with their own messaging. And I think it's, it's, it's keen to point out that they have something to talk about, but the actual economic forces of building more units, incentivizing more units, those units are not going to come online under the new 421A, 45X, Affordable mm -hmm. Neighborhoods New York program, I think we're calling it. Um, those units aren't going to come on for years. So right. actually seeing the economic effects of adding supply to the housing market aren't going to happen until maybe even Governor Hochul's out of office. Call that a political shield, mm -hmm. you know? Right. If, if, the, if you can't quite uh, decide, you know, if it's good or bad, you can keep talking about how it's great if you're Democrats. Yeah, and it was clear that there were so many competing interests when it came to housing. There was tenant interest, real estate interest, labor interest. So did anyone come out as a winner or did everyone sort of get the short end of the stick um, in the housing deal? I think it's safe to say the building trades uh, got a win with their uh, wage floor deal. Um, it's a very complicated wage deal, <laughs> right. geographically yeah. speaking, and um, uh, different, it's progressive sliding scale over the years. but. I think they, they secured a win, um, and although the, the folks in Housing Justice for All and the tenant prote protections um, are, are definitely not framing this as a win, um, the fact that they got as sizable of a portion of, of this um, in there uh, that, that was part of the oh, final right plan right. Is, um, is probably pretty significant considering uh, how many votes they actually had in the legislature. Um, you look at the the numbers they were putting out, they were pretty much putting out their whip count on Twitter uh, as, <laughs> yeah. as the negotiations, negotiations, negotiations were ongoing, and they didn't have the votes to hold this up, hold up a package over this. Right. Um, so the fact that they brokered something out of this deal is probably a win for them, even if they're not saying it. And when we look at this year compared to last year, I know last year, right, bail reform took up a lot of the conversation, um, but when we look at the way that Democrats were um, looking at crime this year, they didn't really seem to focus on bail reform. They were more so talking about retail theft and um, cracking down on illegal cannabis shops. So why do you think bail reform wasn't so much a part of the conversation this year? I think people are a little tired of the bail reform conversation. It's been around for a number of years at this point, and mm -hmm. there hasn't been much change. You know, it's been incremental if there's been any discussion at all. I think Democrats this year really wanted to attack something specific to crime that was visible. And you know, a late, the latest SCRI poll, Siena College poll, says that even though a majority of New Yorkers don't necessarily think that the illegal marijuana shops are a huge problem, a vast majority do want to see some action on it. So I mm -hmm. think that's you know, them responding to voter sentiment at that point. And right wing media, of course, isn't focusing on bail reform so much this year. You know, sure. last year, yeah. just time and time and time again, you know, whether it's uh, the newspapers, the cable news, um, so much talk about, you know, an out of control New York City. You had um, Lee Zeldin had just run um, in the gubernatorial race in 2022. This time around, we're hearing a lot more talk about migrants mm -hmm, right. is kind of the drum that they're beating, retail theft, which is an issue they did deal with in the budget. So, you know, Democrats have been very reactive on criminal justice, um, um, addressing criticisms of criminal justice reforms. And I think the fact that um, the conservative side of things have laid off it a little bit in favor of migrants, retail theft, and other issues also had a lot to do um, with bail reform just not being discussed so much this time around. I think really the power of, of um, maybe not one or the other, but specifically illicit cannabis shops and mm. the retail theft issue, were those are issues that people are calling their, their local legislators about, that mm -hmm. our people True. in district offices yeah. are getting calls about, um, and that lawmakers substantively have an opportunity to do something on and then go and hit the campaign trail on it now and in the weeks to come. Uh, so I think those were really some of the motivating factors in those pieces of the budget. And I wanted to get into health care. So as we know, Medicaid is a huge portion of the budget. Um, and Governor Hochul made it clear at the top of the year that she wanted to really find ways to save. So in the final enacted budget, they were able to find ways to save. One of them um, included cuts to the CDPAP program, which we know there were a lot of advocates who came out in opposition to that plan um, in the final days of the budget negotiations. One thing that I thought was interesting on the floor, um, Senate Health um, Committee Chair Gustavo Rivera, I cannot count the amount of times he said, you know, I wouldn't have put forth this plan. It isn't my favorite plan. So, you know, why did it appear that the senator's hands were sort of tied when it came to this compromise? 
I think the, um, the CDPAP debate was kind of laying latent in the budget. Uh, the governor rolled out some suggested changes in her 30-day amendments, not necessarily in her initial proposal, outside of cutting a wage parity boost. This is really dense policy-wise. Yeah. Um, but she had been advocating for uh, changes to the CDPAP program. Uh, what was unexpected is the last minute change that became part of negotiations, I believe a week or two before, uh, or a few days before the governor came out and announced her, I'll just call it a handshake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was kind of surprising that, that came out at the last minute. So moving what are hundreds of these fiscal middlemen in this program down to one selected by uh, the Department of Health was kind of a shock to a lot of folks. And you saw, as you mentioned, a lot of those advocates coming out. Um, what perspired on the floor, um, or precipitated on the floor, um, was a kind of an interesting debate to watch because there wasn't a lot of nuance to that discussion, actually. I happened to catch the, the debate you're referring to with Senator Rivera and Senator Pam Helming at the, at the time, and neither of them could even call it its full name, the Consumer Directed Personal yeah. Assistance, mm -hmm. Assistance right. Program. Uh, so there was a lot of nuance to that, and it came kind of out of the blue at the last minute, which was a surprising proposal. Um, the, neither the governor, nobody really was floating, and it's um, still trying to diagnose where exactly that plan to move to one fiscal intermediary came from. Uh, it's a model a lot of other states have, uh, but there's a lot of concerns about what one firm will be picked to uh, select a bunch of regional firms off of that. Now, I might just point out that whenever we talk about Medicaid, there's one party that matters probably more than even the legislature, and that's 1199 SDIU, right. the most powerful union in the state. And, you know, you, as Vaughn pointed out, you had all these different providers go down to one. Interestingly enough, it's going to be a heck of a lot easier to organize, to unionize one provider versus this constellation of others. Right. Yeah. And, and not to protract this discussion, but one of the very interesting things was you, you had this group, I'm drawing a blank on the name off the top of my head, uh, that stayed in the war room overnight. It was Thursday night into a Friday mm -hmm. right before the governor yeah, announced okay. her handshake. Mm -hmm. uh, they represent independent living centers, which really started the CDPAP program. They stayed in the war room overnight advocating for their issue. The next morning, 1199 comes out with a statement uh, supporting changes to the CDPAP program, but specifically outlining a, a carve out for the independent living centers. Yeah. Part of the deal that, that uh, ultimately came to fruition, there is a specific part of the budget that dictates there must be a carve out or there must be a subcontractor, fiscal intermediary for the independent living centers. And what about the items that didn't make it into the final enacted budget, such as the New York Heat Act and the child privacy laws that I know you have been following closely, Zach? Is there a path forward for these bills um, throughout the rest of the year? It's, it's always easier to get things done in the budget. The governor just constitutionally has so much more leverage and really can drive an agenda and also just kind of distract with some issues and kind of get other issues in. Something that's interesting with the governor this time, again, compared to last year, was how she kind of picked her battles much more effectively. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, she quickly dropped a proposal to really upend how public schools are funded in the state. Um, and she was really going to face a very tough lobbying campaign from the tech industry on proposed legislation on data privacy protections for children, lim you know, restricting um, algorithmic social media feeds for kids. And, you know, for all the talk from the governor and Attorney General mm -hmm. Letitia James, it was interesting how quiet they got in the final weeks, um, absent one event at the Capitol, on what they said was must-do legislation that mm -hmm. I doubt at this point is really going to get addressed in the remaining weeks of the session. And unfortunately, we are coming up on time, but I wanted to hear from each of you. Did anyone come out as a winner? You know, from my purview, it appears that the governor got a lot of the things that she wanted in the budget. She wanted retail theft. She wanted cannabis enforcement. She wanted housing. So is it safe to say that Hochul is the overall winner in this budget process? I think she certainly walked away with a lot of victories. I think you can't undercut that foundation aid uh, right. change, yeah. the school funding change. Uh, she was really gung-ho on that and you know, said that a study would be kicking the can down the road, right. something she didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be up for debate again next year uh, after Absolutely. the uh, Rockefeller Institute finishes their study. So that becomes a battle for next year. I think the real winner out of this budget is, is labor uh, across the board. UFT got provisions uh, with an extension of mayoral control of New York City schools. Building trades got a wage floor within the housing deal. Uh, and 1199 possibly got um, 
250,000 new uh, dues-paying members out of the CDPAP program. Hard to follow up these guys, but I just point out tech industry, Meta, which owns Facebook, Google, um, they really scored some big victories here. If New York had restricted social media feeds for kids, that could have had national ramifications. These are companies that make billions of dollars from sucking data from children, selling it to advertisers, and while there was a lot of talk from Democrats about doing something about it, they didn't do anything. And by the way, the tech industry also got uh, about uh, nearly $300 million thrown for uh, an AI supercomputer in Buffalo that uh, might help uh, them develop some talent for, for employment later on. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. And we were speaking with Zach Williams of Bloomberg Law, Vaughn Golden of the New York Post, and Alex Galt of the Watertown Daily Times and Northern New York newspapers. And now turning to another important budget topic. Through the years, SUNY Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn has faced a slew of financial issues, which is largely in part due to the COVID-19 pandemic. At the top of the year, the governor proposed closing the hospital and diverting services by the summer, leading to great opposition from advocates and lawmakers, while the governor and legislative leaders were engrossed in negotiations. In the end, the final enacted budget included funding to keep the hospital open for another year. We spoke with Assemblymember Brian Cunningham, who represents the Assembly District that the hospital falls in, about the work to keep it open and his legislative priorities for the rest of the year. Here's that conversation. Thank you so much for joining us, Assemblymember. Thank you so much for having me. And of course, I know that the state budget has just recently been passed and lawmakers worked through the weekend to get it over the legislative finish line. So I wanted to get your perspective on the overall budget process this year. And how do you feel about the policy items that ultimately made it in the final enacted budget? Obviously, I think, you know, our leader, Carl Hasty always does a good job at masterfully negotiating a very tough budget process, taking into account um, the regions of the state taking it in regards to the priorities of the state and also trying to compromise with the governor. I think, you know, no state budget is perfect, um, but definitely a budget reflects the values of this legislative body and the governor. And I think we did a really good job. You know, you think about um, some of the things that are in the housing, again, not perfect, um, but we were able to do some really um, amazing things in this budget. Um, and I think most importantly, we were able to save downstate, which is probably top of mind for me, the most important thing um, that came out of the state budget turning back home. Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned SUNY Downstate. You've been pretty vocal on your opposition of any plans to close down the hospital. It's no secret that SUNY Downstate has faced a lot of um, financial difficulties through the years, but luckily in the budget, the budget um, included capital funding for the hospital and funding to help with the overall operations of the hospital and to implement an advisory board. So I wanted to get your perspective on, you know, what was included in the budget. Do you think it is enough? Well, let me say this. One, I'm happy that um, my bill made it into the budget um, and that we're able to save downstate with, like you said, the makeup of a commission, a community advisory board, which is going to help shape the future of downstate. And obviously the funding, which is so critical because, you know, in January, we were told that the hospital could close by July um, of this year. Um, obviously, an investment of 100 a million dollars in expense for this year and next year is, I think, critical to keeping the hospital services open. And obviously, $300 million, as you mentioned, is a capital, but that's the floor, not the ceiling. I'm looking forward to the second half of this fight, which is twofold. One, working with our federal partners, um, and I've had a con conversation with the congresswoman already in terms of finding federal funds um, as we look forward to the new year. And the second piece is really making sure that we come back to the table and figure out what the commission says the hospital needs. Um, if it's a wing, it's a wing. If it's a brand new hospital, state of the art, that's what we get. But wanted to make sure there's a process in which the community can weigh in, wanted to make sure there's a process in which we actually looked at the look back and made sure that we looked at how much years of investment we didn't have in the hospital and what do we need for the future of healthcare. The last piece that's really, really important is the federal reimbursement rates. Um, making sure we work with our federal partners to close that. You know, for every procedure done on a Medicaid and Medicare patient in, at Downstate, we only receive 30% um, or 30% less for those funds. Um, we have to make sure we actually get all of that resource to make sure we can keep the hospital sustainable for the future. And what were your conversations like with Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty and the Executive Chamber, as well as um, SUNY Chancellor John King about saving the hospital this year? 
But one, I did uh, make a commitment both publicly and to uh, the stakeholders that I would vote no on any budget that closed any services downstate. Um, and I think they heard that very loud and clear. The second piece is we have to invest in downstate. I think you covered it about a year ago. I brought Speaker Hasty to the district. Um, we made more walk through downstate hospital, and there was a commitment then to make sure this is going to be a priority in this budget. Um, so obviously, we're shocked early this year when the announcement came out that there was a plan that did not include community voices. I'm happy that the chancellor and I have had a good working relationship. The governor and I have had a, a phenomenal working relationship, and the speaker and I have, I have a great partnership. Um, and I think because of those things, and because of communication, and because of the needs, and how important downstate is not only to Central Brooklyn but to the medical field in general. You think about it, downstate graduates, one third doctors of color, um, not only in the city or the state, but in the country. Um, so this is a critical um, hospital. It's a teaching hospital. And it's also a research center where the MRI was created. Um, I can't imagine any conversation where downstate will be closing. Um, so we're just happy that we're back on the right track and trying to get it to a place where it's going to be sustainable for the next 50 years to 100 years. And another legislative priority that you've had has been focusing on cracking down on EBT theft. So can you tell us, you know, why this has been important to you and what you've been hearing from your constituents about how EBT theft has impacted not only their lives, but also their pockets? Yeah, you know, one of the big things that we hear at our um, constituent service team is that housing is obviously the number one issue we face. But the second one was food insecurity. And the third one was EBT theft, which was surprising to me when I started looking at um, some of our data. Um, EBT theft is becoming a rapid crime where because a lot of these EBT cards don't have chip technology and because there's no notification when someone's EBT card is compromised, you have people who literally are trying to feed their families who are on the register line at the grocery store swiping their cards only to discover at that moment that their funding has been stolen. Um, myself and um, Selimber Sandberg from Queens have teamed up with a package of legislation really focused on cracking down on EBT theft. Um, one of those bills have passed already, um, which is uh, making sure that people get notification. And the second piece is not really holding people accountable for their actions. Anyone who can steal food from a family um, is worthy of potentially facing um, a court and seeing a judge. Um, so we're working on the second part of this legislation to make sure that no family in the state of New York goes hungry, particularly those who are being um, subsidized by the state and federal government with food support services. And as you underscored, housing continues to be a very serious crisis, both in New York State and New York City. And it is certainly an issue that took up a lot of the oxygen when, you know, I was speaking to leaders about the budget negotiation. So what is your perspective on the housing proposal that was included in the final enacted budget? Again, I think no budget is perfect. And I think the interesting thing about this housing protection, this housing plan that we passed, um, it had four parts, right? It had um, some tenant protections, which again, we can never go um, too far in tenant protection. I think we obviously need to do more to protect tenants, particularly tenants who are paying their rents and are being um, sometimes abused by unscrupulous landlords. Um, we did something for the development community in terms of making sure that there's incentives to develop um, with some tax abatements. We know that the cost of development is expensive, particularly in New York State um, and the city specifically. Um, so we need to do something on the tax piece. And the last piece will be did something for labor. Um, really working towards wages that allow the people who build our communities to stay in our communities and have the kind of protection of the job where they won't be hurt. Um, I think by doing some of those things, again, anytime you leave a negotiation table and nobody's completely happy, um, I think that means we had a really good negotiation because there were pieces that people had to give up at the table and pieces they got included. And I think that, again, this housing plan that Speaker, the Governor, and the Leader of the Senate put together along with us um, is one that we can build on. Again, most of these things are first steps. They're not the final step. There's still a lot more work to do, um, particularly in tenant protections, particularly on making sure that our MWBE communities um, are included and local developers are included. Um, but I think this is the first step and we have another two months to work on really thoughtful policy pieces that I think can enhance what we've done so far. And as we head into the last two months of the legislative session, what is your mindset to ensure that it is the most successful? And also what is your mindset as you gear up for reelection this year? Yeah, I mean, one of the things um, we talk about the success of this session, the first half of the year is obviously uh, making sure we have a budget that's a working document of our values, our collective values. And now we work on the policy piece. So the second half is really just zoned in on policy. Um, for my team and I, we already have met twice this week already to think about the piece of legislation that we want to prioritize 
towards the end of this session. And for me and my staff, what we do is we really look at um, our constituent service cases that come in and we try to parallel or juxtapose that to um, some of the issues we're seeing and some of the bills we have and really making sure we get those across the finish line. Um, always in that list is education, always in that list is housing, always in that list is access to food. And obviously I think, you know, we, the state has done a really good job of maternal health. Um, over the last couple of months as well, first in the nation to provide prenatal uh, maternal health. Um, and with uh, so many of the states around the country tripping away um, women's um, health and autonomy, uh, we want to make sure we can see to codify that here in the state of New York. So I think there's no shortage of things we can do over the next two months. And I'm excited about that and excited about um, being reelected and coming back for another two years to do some more work over the next few years. Well, there's certainly a lot to look forward to, but unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there for now. Thank you so much for joining us, Assembly Member. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to our next conversation. Absolutely. And we were speaking with Assembly Member Brian Cunningham. And as the Assembly Member underscored, with just a few weeks left in the legislative session and the budget finally out of the way, lawmakers will be working hard to get the rest of their legislative priorities over the finish line and we'll bring you updates on those policy issues right here on the show and online on our website. That's at nynow.org. Well, that does it for this edition of New York Now. Thank you for tuning in and see you next week. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET.